long the world has looked upon our island, and we have never feared the scrutiny. For here the sea, the mountains, and the quiet fields have bred a mixture rich and rare. Celt, Norman, Saxon, and much else besides, peoples distinct in one small island, yet undivided to the world. That is the ancient paradox of Britain, a paradox that irritates, confounds, and in the end, inspires. What kind of a people do they think we are? The answer to that famous question still resounds for those who have the will to listen. For here in Britain, we remain peculiarly ourselves, united by a common heritage that in its proper season moves us on to find our real statue, be it Passchendaele or Dunkirk. That's why I put my faith in people, not in theories or abstractions, but in men. I'm sure we all agree with you, Norman. So long as by men you also mean women. As someone once said in Parliament, the army embraces the ATS. So I think you can safely assume that man embraces woman. And a very sensible arrangement, too. You see, men never take women seriously if they can help it. Never mind, Rosamond. They've had to in the past 50 years. Yes, I think any historian of the period would have to hand it to the ladies. Bless them. You sound quite Victorian. Mr. A.J. Pease wouldn't have agreed. Who was he? A.J. Pease? He was an MP. And this is what he said about you in 1901. I want everybody to have a vote, except, of course, women, and those men not in full possession of their faculties. The ladies have changed all that. And no thanks to Mr. Pease. Thank you, Lord Brabazon. Thank you, madam. It's hard to believe that only 50 years ago we had no voice in government, no admittance to the law, universities, engineering, medical schools, or anything else very much. And yet a woman had ruled the empire successfully for 64 years. Well, that should prove something, don't you think? There have been other changes, too. According to the record, we're all less murderous, less intoxicated, less given to stealing, but more bigamous. <laughs> That's a good one. That's what comes of giving women their freedom. You didn't give it to us. We took it and fought for it jolly hard. All right, you deserve a medal. In fact, I think we all do, just for living in this century of miracles. But the most important miracle is still the human spirit. A truth made clear, even in her passing, by a great woman. Victoria was dead, and an incredulous nation mourned her passing. Victoria meant the empire, with Kipling its prophet. Victoria meant peace, the great Pax Britannica. Victoria was the very symbol of an age and its outlook. Victoria was dead. Then with the accession of her son, King Edward, came a new gaiety into life. A relaxation of the rigid codes that govern society. Just as Victorian days evoke an atmosphere, so does the name Edwardian, an era so short, yet with a subtle flavor all its own.
Life had its share of troubles in those days too. Industrial unrest was frequent, and the military were in the streets from time to time. For the hidden trends of a newborn century were already becoming apparent. There were troubles between the Lords and the Commons, which the Commons won in the end. Troubles with Ireland, which I suppose it's safe now to say Ireland won in the end. Troubles with income tax, grievous troubles. Trouble with a thing called national health and licking stamps for a Welsh attorney. And troubles with the women. But they were remarkable women, Mrs. Pankhurst and her followers. Who would believe that a social revolution could be achieved in long petticoats by fragile women who suffered privation, imprisonment, and even a parody in Punch? Whenever they're commanded to raid the house at night, they march out with their banners of purple, green, and white, and smack policemen's faces for that sea etiquette in a row, 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 row of the British suffragettes. And when the raid is over and some to jail are sent, they say that they are martyrs and never will repent. And should the scorn of prison food with feeding tunes be met, there's an awful row, 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 row from the British suffragette. The British suffragette. In spite of all, she was to gain her point and influence the status of women throughout the world. But all that was as yet a whole age away. In the meantime, Edward died. And at his funeral, the crowned heads of Europe gathered to pay homage, perhaps the last occasion of its kind. For now, so many of the crowns they wore are, like them, less than the dust. After six long centuries, Wales received once more its promised English prince. A young boy walked through the gateways at Carnarvon guided by his father's hand, with light upon him from his father's eyes. A fair young prince in an ancient castle. He who was destined to be king, the king who never wore his crown.